Uh, hello, welcome to How To Academy. I am Robin Ince. Uh, I'm not going to do any preamble and say anything about our guest tonight because you will probably know that anyway, or you can just go and look it up and it will waste a lot of our time. Suffice to say, Michio Kaku's new book is The God Equation. We're going to be talking a lot about that. But thank you very much for joining us. Before we get into the contents of the book, it seems important to maybe talk about science news that we've seen, particularly over the last 24 hours, from Fermilab. So, Mitch, Mitch, thank you so much for joining us. Um, let's get straight. What do we, we're hearing things about the standard model. We're hearing about possibly changes within the laws of physics. Can you tell us a little bit about what we've seen coming from Fermilab? Well, this is huge, not just Fermilab, but the Large Hadron Collider outside Geneva, Switzerland. We have a rough theory of subatomic particles. It's called the standard model. However, it's ugly as sin. It's one of the ugliest theories ever proposed with 36 quarks and antiquarks, 20 free parameters that you can adjust any way you want, three identical generations. It goes on and on and on. It can't be the final theory. So. Any slight deviation from the standard model is going to generate huge headlines in the physics community. Now we have not one, but two, two sets of experiments that show that, well, the standard model is not perfect. And that signals there could be a higher theory, a higher theory beyond this ugly mess called the standard model. The standard model is sort of like taking a whale, an aardvark, and a platypus, scotch taping them together and calling this nature's finest evolutionary creation. The end product of millions of years of evolution. Nobody believes that the standard model is the final theory. It's a theory only a mother can love. Even its creators say that this cannot be the final theory. So we now have a clue. We're betting now, maybe it's supersymmetry, maybe string theory. All sorts of bets are now being placed on the table as to what is causing this anomaly in Chicago and outside Geneva, Switzerland. This is big news in physics. Now, I mean, it's interesting when you talk about the, the, the ugliness of the standard model, because you also, in, in, in the God Equation, you quote G.H. Hardy about saying, basically, there's no room for ugly mathematics. Is that one of the things that has driven you? Uh, and do you think it drives physics that sometimes you look at a theory and you can say, no, ultimately, underneath this, there has to be something more harmonious. There has to be something with greater order and beauty behind this chaos. Well, you know, after World War II, we began to split protons apart. And we found not one particle, not two, but hundreds, hundreds of subatomic, a zoo of particles coming out when we shattered a proton. And then G. Robert Oppenheimer, father of the atomic bomb, made the public statement, quote, the Nobel Prize in physics should go to the physicist who does not discover a new particle this year. We were drowning in subatomic particles. And so the standard model, nobody likes it, but hey, it works. You can't doubt the fact for 50 years, it's fit all the data. But we know it's like the tail of a lion. Einstein once said that if you see the tail of a lion, you can assume that there's a lion at the other end. And that's why we're taking bets now. We're taking bets as to what could be the theory beyond the standard model. Is it a grand unified theory, a supersymmetric theory, a string theory? This is exciting because the standard model has held sway for 50 years. I was a grad student back then when the standard model was created. It's been boring. It's been so boring, stuck with this ugly theory for 50 years. And now we see the light at the end of the tunnel. A deviation in two laboratories, two sets of experiments, pointing out the fact that as we suspected, there's a higher theory out there. That is so exciting. But it's interesting, when you talk about that excitement, and as you mentioned in the book, well, well we're, actually, I'm, I'm going to come back to this. So let's get a couple of things for, from the book sorted, first of all. And, and one of them is the theory of everything. So when people hear that term theory of everything, and we hear it more and more, can you explain what has been that problem in physics? For the last 50 years, it's been particularly apparent, hasn't it? Well, all of biology can be explained in the language of chemistry. All of chemistry can be explained in the language of physics. All of physics can be explained in the language of two theories. 
One, relativity, the theory of the very big, big bangs and black holes, and the theory of the very small, the quantum theory, which gives us transistors, lasers, the internet, all the modern wonders in our living room. The problem is these two theories don't like each other. They hate each other. Can you imagine? Can you imagine a god with a left hand and a right hand? They don't talk to each other. That's incredible. That's what a theory of everything will do. Unify the theory of the big with the theory of the small. That is a quantum theory of gravity. That's the holy grail. That is what Einstein and others tried to find for the last 30 years of his life. He struggled with it. And we think that there is, quote, a God equation that will allow us to, quote, read the mind of God. So that's the holy grail, an equation no more than one inch long, perhaps, to read the mind of God. Think of E equals MC squared. That is one of the greatest equations of all time. It is half an inch long, but it unifies M, the matter of the sun, with E, the energy output of sunlight. A simple equation unifies matter and energy. Now we want a similar equation that unifies everything, all of biology, all of chemistry, all of physics into an equation one inch long. That's the holy grail. And when, I mean, how far back do we have to go? Because it, it appears that we are able to observe the universe and kind of find ways to get away with not being worried about the clash between these two laws, these two principles. But at what point does it become a, a, an insurmountable issue? Well, you talked about going into the past, right? Uh, 2,000 years ago, the Greeks asked the question, what is the world made of anyway? There's got to be a theme, a paradigm, a principle that unifies the entire universe. Democritus thought it was atoms. A means cannot, tum means cut, atom means that which cannot be cut. But Pythagoras of the Pythagorean theorem said, no, 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 no. Atoms cannot explain the diversity, the richness, the variety of matter in the universe. The only thing capable of explaining the diversity of everything is music. Music, he said. He saw a lyre string. And when you pluck a lyre string, the longer the string, the lower the note. And he said, aha, mathematics. The mathematics of resonances, notes, will give you a theory of everything. Well, today we have something called string theory. And if you had a super microscope, you could see that an electron is not a dot at all. An electron is really a rubber band. You twang the rubber band and it vibrates in a different way and you call it a neutrino. You twang it again and it becomes a quark. You twang it any number of times and it becomes any number of the hundreds of subatomic particles. So each subatomic particle is a musical note. Physics is the harmonies that you can write on these musical notes. Chemistry is the melodies you can play on these interacting strings. The universe is a symphony of vibrating strings. And the mind of God, the mind of God that Einstein spent 30 years of his life chasing after, the mind of God is cosmic music resonating through hyperspace. That is the mind of God. And it's God, of course, you know, sometimes as, as we, I know people who with the Higgs boson wished it hadn't been called the God particle and looking back, they felt that was, and, and obviously, as you said, we hear about the mind of God, God doesn't play dice. There was something I wanted, Frank Wilczek in his recent book, he decided, he, he, he gave it what he thinks God is to the physicist. He says, in studying how the world works, we are studying how God works and thereby learning what God is. In that spirit, we can interpret the search for knowledge as a form of worship and our discoveries as a revelation. How do you feel about that summary? Well, I feel the same existential shock, realizing that as a child, there could be a cosmic order to the entire universe. You know, when I was eight years old, everything started for me. When I was eight years old, my life changed. A great scientist had just died and the newspapers all carried a picture of his desk. That's all, just a picture of his desk with an unfinished manuscript on top. And the caption, I'll never forget it. The caption said, this is the unfinished work of the greatest scientist of our time. 
And I said to myself, wow, I had this existential shock, this epiphany. I said, what could be so hard? It's a homework problem, right? He could talk to his mother. What could be so hard that the greatest scientists of our time couldn't finish it? Well, I went to the library. I found out that this man was called Albert Einstein, and he was searching for an equation like E equals MC squared, but it would unify the universe. And I said to myself, wow, that's for me. That's what I want to work on for the rest of my life to complete this dream. This dream going back to the ancient Greeks, this dream going back to Pythagoras, who talked about music, music being the unified theme of the universe. Well, today we have a theory. It's just a theory, not proven yet. It's called string theory. And maybe, just maybe, string theory is what's driving these experiments in Chicago and Geneva, Switzerland, indicating a theory beyond the standard model. You see, what is the standard model? It's the lowest octave. It's the lowest octave of the string, which also contains Einstein's theory. If Einstein had never been born, we would have, would have discovered all of relativity as the lowest octave of a vibrating string. And they have, there are higher octaves. Maybe that's what we're picking up in Chicago and Geneva, Switzerland. The next octave up. That's what's driving all, all this excitement. The fact that now we have a clue, a clue that goes beyond the standard model, a clue that says, aha, this could be the beginning of a theory of everything that's measurable in the laboratory right before our eyes. We could be witnessing history in the making. Do you ever find, is there, a, if, if you think back to that, that eight-year-old boy who saw that obituary, saw that picture to the desk, is there ever a frustration, because I always get a feeling with you that there's a tremendous amount of optimism, which is that we have sometimes wonderful theories, but we haven't got the technology that's caught up yet. So this, you know, and that would have probably, you know, a great issue for Einstein and other scientists of that time, which is on the blackboard, things may stand, and at times they may well even go, well, the equations work out, but they're not testable as yet. Does that disparity sometimes between the philosophy of an idea and actually its ability to test that idea, do you ever find that frustrating? It's frustrating, but you know, back in the year 1666, there was another theory of almost everything. There was a pandemic that hit London. One quarter of the population died in the Great Plague of 1666. There was a young 23-year-old man at Cambridge University. Cambridge was shut down. He went home. And walking on his estate, he saw an apple fall. And then he asked the key question, the question of the ages. If an apple falls, does the moon also fall? And then he realized, yes, the moon also falls. And then he started to write down equations that would govern the falling moon. And then he was so frustrated. The mathematics of 1666 did not allow him to calculate the trajectory of a falling moon. So what did he do? He mathematics. It's called calculus, which today is called math one when you go to college. And that man, of course, was Isaac Newton, the man who created a theory of almost everything. He must have been so frustrated that the mathematics of his time would not allow him to unify the laws of the heaven with the laws of the earth. So he created his own mathematics. Well, we physicists working on string theory feel the same way. The mathematics we have is not powerful enough to solve the theory. So what do we do? We create our own mathematics. mathematics. So in other words, we have become mathematicians trying to tease apart a theory which is smarter than we are. You see, we discovered this theory by accident. We were not supposed to see this theory, perhaps for another 100 years. It is so bizarre, so advanced, that even mathematicians are dying to learn this theory. You know the Fields Medal, the Nobel Prize of Mathematics? If you want to get the next uh, Fields Medal, you pretty much have to learn string theory, because that's where new mathematics is being created in string theory. But again, the frustration, of course, is the same thing that we felt in 1666. Prove it. Prove that your theory works. Well, not only do we have this anomaly in Geneva and also Chicago now, we also have dark matter. 
and dark energy, a new form of matter beyond atoms. You know, every textbook for children says that the world is made mainly of atoms, right? Wrong. The world is not mainly made of atoms. It's mainly made out of something that's invisible. It has gravity, but it's invisible. If I had dark matter in my hand, it would filter right through my fingertips, go right through the concrete under my floor, go right through Manhattan, all the way to China, reverse direction in China and come back to New York City. That's dark matter. We think dark matter is the next octave of the string. And one of these days, some physicists will say, we have captured dark matter in our spark chamber. That could prove the theory by showing that something beyond the standard model represents the next octave of the string. So you see, there are a number of experiments that we can do to prove the correctness of the theory. The only people who don't know that are the, the critics. They haven't read the literature on string theory. There are many experiments that we can create to test string theory. I wanted to ask you because, again, go, going back to your, your, your childhood and just before we started uh, this, before we turned the cameras on, talk a little bit about during your career how much the universe has changed, that what the universe was and the universe that you were taught at university and the things that you were told were of no interest. I think it's quite an interesting thing just to give the people watching some kind of sense of this different understanding of what the universe is made of and its potential. When I was a grad student learning particle physics for the first time in the 1970s, so many years ago, it was a very quaint world. Black holes were considered science fiction. If you wanted to work on black holes, you were pretty much ostracized and people would say, what are, you, what are you doing? This is not Flash Gordon, this is not Star Trek. But hey, you know, that's a whole new field now pioneered by Stephen Hawking. And then trying to work on a theory of everything people's eyes would glaze over. Their eyeballs would look up in the heavens, they would shake their heads, and they would repeat what Wolfgang Pauli said, Nobel laureate. Wolfgang Pauli once said, what God has torn asunder after the Big Bang, let no man put together. In other words, how dare you? How dare you reverse God's will? That God shattered the laws of physics back at the instant of the Big Bang, that's why we have so many fragments of the Big Bang everywhere. Four fundamental forces, quarks, leptons everywhere. You dare to reverse that process to become like God? Well, that's the way it was when I was a grad student. And then along comes black holes, string theory, Stephen Hawking comes along and revolutionizes the whole field. And so we realize that sometimes things that are considered science fiction become the cutting edge of physics research. This is amazing. The fact that what was considered preposterous when I was a grad student is now considered mainstream physics. Because you mentioned Wolfgang Pauli, I should mention that there's a great story in, in your book where you talk about him giving a lecture, in which afterwards Niels Bohr came up to him and said, we think your theory is crazy, but is it crazy enough? Now, that's such an interesting thing in terms of the levels of crazy required. Crazy within the limits, then, of the testability of the equations of all this. I mean, how much do you feel? Because I think for a lot of people, when they first when they first hear about ideas of something basically coming from nothing, when they first hear about the fact that even vacuums, the activity of what might happen in a vacuum, when they hear all of the different ideas that are thrown up by quantum mechanics and ideas of what happens in a black hole and just outside a black hole, it starts... And it sounds absurd. It sounds too crazy. Well, let me tell you how crazy string theory is. String theory is defined in 11-dimensional hyperspace, a dimension beyond everything we can conceive of. Now, let me explain. Children ask the question when they go to the science museum, mommy, daddy, they say, if the universe is expanding, what is it expanding into? If the universe is everything, then how can everything expand into anything at all? That's crazy. Well, string theory says, well, Einstein said that the universe is a bubble. We live on the skin of the bubble and the bubble's expanding. But string theory says there are other bubbles out there. This is mind blowing, other bubbles. And sometimes these bubbles bump into each other and that's the Big Bang. The Big Bang is the collision of bubbles 
or the fissioning of bubbles because we live in a multiverse, a multiverse of universes. Big bangs are happening all the time. Even as we spoke at the beginning, universes have been created. Parallel universes floating in a larger universe. Now, when I was a child, I realized that my parents were Buddhists. And in Buddhism, there is nirvana, no beginning, no end of time, just nirvana. But as a child, they put me in a Presbyterian church. I learned all about Genesis. I learned all about how God created the universe. So I had two contradictory ideas in my head. Either the universe had a beginning or it didn't. There's no two ways about it. Wrong. Now we realize you can put these two theories together. You see, our universe had a beginning. There was a Big Bang, but it floats in a much larger arena. It's a bubble in a bubble bath. And sometimes they bump into other bubbles and create Big Bangs. And what is this larger arena? Nirvana, the Nirvana of hyperspace. Now, Stephen Hawking called this the space-time foam, that on a small scale, you have tiny universes being created. He called it the space-time foam, otherwise known as a bubble bath. And then you're going to ask me the next question. I always get this question. If there are such parallel universes, then is Elvis Presley still alive in one of these parallel universes? Well, yeah. You can write down the equations to create a universe where Elvis Presley is still belting out hits, but in another universe. This is how crazy this theory is. The only thing going for it, like inflation theory, is that it fits the data. Inflation theory, which postulates a multiverse of universes, is consistent with all the data. Now, you talk to a kid and they say, I know all about that. I, I, I watch comics. I mean, I see the movies. And in the latest Avengers, the latest Avenger movie, guess what? The whole plot takes place in the multiverse, which is what I do for a living. I work on string theory, and in string theory is defined in the multiverse. So even children have caught up with us. But this is – see, what, what, what in, in, intrigues me as well is what you see because talking to different physicists, some physicists when I talk to them say they, they see equations when they talk about 11 dimensions. And others it seems and, – and, and in the book you mentioned Richard Feynman a few times and some people say he had synesthesia and that that was one of the things which seemed that he could make these incredible leaps – almost a leap with where he had to do the working out afterwards get to the answer and then go now I'll find out how how I and so when you when you're thinking about those ideas when you're thinking of string theory when you think about parallel universes what are you seeing in your mind at that point well you know evolution has given us a brain by which we can visualize three dimensional tigers and three dimensional bears and we can avoid them however our brain does not understand five-dimensional bears or six-dimensional tigers because they don't threaten us. No six-dimensional tiger has ever jumped on me, so evolution did not give me the ability to visualize these higher dimensions. 